Hello everyone. Um, my name is Alexandre Santacreo. I'll be moderating today's event. But for the opening, I would like to introduce Dr. Yangte Kim, Secretary General of the International Transport Forum. Dr. Kim, the floor is yours for the opening. Thank you, Alex. And hi, everybody. And get out of the mundo. Uh, every, every minute, uh, one one person dies in city traffic, and theoretically, that means that over the next sixty minutes, sixty people will lose their lives. So there is no time to lose, and there is no time to waste. As you, as you know well, recently the United Nations adopted a new target for twenty thirties, that of reducing road death by half. So the International Transport Forum launched the report last week. It is called Best Practice for Urban Road Safety. As the name suggests, it draws lessons from cities working hard to reduce the number of road deaths. Lessons are transferable to other cities. So we believe that we will have a very positive impact. The report was made possible thanks to a network of road safety experts. This network was developed thanks to an initiative called Safer City Streets. This is delivered by the ITF with funding from the FIA, for which we are very thankful. In, 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 in general, uh, we have a central government as our main context for ITF, but Safer City Streets is exceptional and extraordinary in the sense that ITF interacts with the cities. The network on this local level connects 48 cities with a large community of urban road safety experts. Over 300 different individuals participated in one of the global network meetings organized so far. There was no meeting this year, unfortunately, because of the COVID-19, but with webinars, we hope to keep the momentum for knowledge exchange. And today we are very privileged to hear from four exceptional guests all four are playing a role towards eliminating road deaths in London. In the next webinars, you will also hear from Buenos Aires, Bogota, Fortaleza, New York City, and Rotterdam. So stay tuned, and I hope you will enjoy this webinar. And I'm now turning back to Alex, who is moderating this session. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, before we start, uh, so have a, have a look at this map. It shows the, the location of the 48 cities. Uh, and um, today, we are taking you to one of them, to London. So why London? Uh, because it's a city where Vision Zero is uh, not only supported by the mayor and by its transport administration, but uh, also supported by a range of other stakeholders. Uh, this alignment of agencies and partners did not happen by accident and today we will find out what it takes to federate and coordinate agencies. Also we will see that ambitious policies are possible now once there is an agreement on zero being the target and the vision. So we will hear about that in just a minute. I will start by introducing today's uh, panelists. We are privileged to have uh, Stuart Reed, who is Director for Vision Zero at Transport for London, Victoria Lebrecht, Head of Policy, Campaigns and Communications at World Peace. We have Bruce McLean, Assistant Director for City Transportation at the City of London, Andrew Cox, Detective Superintendent at the Roads and Transport Policing Command of the London Metropolitan Police. Thank you all for joining uh, this event and sharing your experience with others. Uh, a quick point of order before we start. If you are attending this webinar, uh, you can send your questions to the panel, not verbally, but uh, via the Q&A box that you will find in the Zoom controls. You can write in Spanish, Portuguese or English and my colleague Rafaela will select and translate your questions for the panel. So my first question will be to Stuart Reed. Uh, hello, Stuart, uh, Director for Vision Zero at Transport hello. London. Uh, your administration pledged to eliminate road death by 2040. 
That's a very ambitious goal. And yet 2040 is far in the future compared to the time elected officials spend in office. So I'd like to know if any interim targets were set and which actions you think could have the most impact. Uh, thank you, Alice. Well, it is an ambitious goal, I and mean, it's also um, uh, just as important commitment. So it's a goal that we can do wherever we can to meet. I'm afraid, Stuart, I'm afraid we don't hear you at all. Uh, we will probably uh, ask you to find a way to reconnect, maybe via your phone or another broadband. And we will uh, catch 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 you later. Is that okay? Thanks. Thank you. Apologies for that. We we did all the okay. testing in the world, but <laughs> uh, I'd like to to turn to uh, Mrs. Lebrecht. Uh, you you nearly lost your life in 2014 in a crash which involved a truck in London. You are now a road safety campaigner working to change the transport system that failed and nearly killed you. So to change that system, uh, I understand that you seek to win the hearts and minds of the population. And so what do you do for that? And what does it take to change, to change public opinion? Thank you. And thank you very much for having me here. Um, yes, I was in a horrible crash with a, a lorry in 2014 and, and lost my leg. I was cycling to work. Um, I work now for Road Peace, which is a charity uh, that supports people um, that have been involved in crashes, either being bereaved or um, seriously injured, like myself. Um, we're not just based in London, so we're, we're a national charity, but we have a, a support group in London. And I think, you know, when it comes to changing public opinion, I think there's, there's quite a few things. Um, I think that the thing that um, Transport for London have done incredibly well is in terms of engaging with stakeholders and engaging with uh, campaign groups and the community um, with the people on this call like Stuart Reid and, and Andy Cox we speak to frequently um, and go to meetings with them to understand what their plans are with Vision Zero. I think that's incredibly important. I think the next thing is in terms of um, having a consistent message and, and, and good relations with the media. I think London has done that really very well and I think the, the journalists that for the most part that comment on on transport initiatives in London um, do so you know in an understanding and positive light and they understand the principles of Vision Zero so I think that's been done very well in terms of explaining you know why this is important and, 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 and the steps to get there um, and then I think you know in terms of changing public opinion I think it ties in again with engaging with stakeholders but I think um, to properly embody Vision Zero, you have to have victims at the heart of what you're doing. And I think, again, London's done that incredibly, incredibly well. I think they're listening to victims. We often have sessions where uh, crash victims, people who've lost someone um, in London, will then come and meet with um, officials working for Transport for London and the Mayor's office. I think those, those are the key things. Thank you. Uh, Stuart. You seem to be back. Shall we, shall we give it a try? I am back. Can you hear me now? Yes, let's try. Uh, talking about your, your ambitions, your targets and, and the actions. Uh. Sure. Thank you. So, so yeah, it, it is an ambitious target and an ambitious objective. And it's also an objective that we see as a, an ethical duty. So it, it's not for us just a policy target. It's something that we really have to do everything we can to deliver for London. And you're right, 2041 might feel uh, comfortably far off in the distance. So we've also set a series of interim targets, um, initially 2022, where we're aiming to reduce deaths and serious by 65% against a baseline of the average deaths and serious injuries for the years 2005 to 2009. Uh, we then have further interim targets for 2030, which we will reset the baseline for, recognising that uh, our current base will be quite a long time in the past by then, and we will continue to pursue these targets. Um, and the key, the key things for us, we, we have adopted the safe systems approach to achieving these targets. And so the four pillars, 
which you know, we, we didn't invent, but we find them a very useful framework. The four pillars that we are pursuing are uh, safe speeds, safe streets, safe behaviors, and safe speeds. And then all of that underpinned by post-collision learning. And as I'm sure um, Victoria was touching on uh, a moment ago on the support of Victor. So that, that provides us a powerful strategic framework. And in line with the theme of, of this conversation, we, we can't deliver within that framework ourselves. Uh, this has to be a multi-agency, multi-organizational commitment. And uh, something, I think, of a, of, a, of a social movement. This can't just be a, uh, a set of policy. This has to be something that we take the general public, the traveling public along. Thank you. Uh, I, I still have some trouble uh, hearing you, uh, and that, that would be a shame. In, in which case, maybe Stuart, maybe going onto the street, you could have a better network, I don't know, but uh, it would be a shame not, not to hear you well for the rest of the webinar. Uh, but I am uh, going to, to broaden the conversation now, uh, because some of you who don't know uh, London, um, if you're not familiar with London and how the streets are managed, uh, you should know that Transport for London manages a network of main roads. Uh, the main roads are called the Red Route. That's about 500 kilometers in length. But 95% of London's streets are the responsibility of 33 independent local authorities. And these streets uh, are not the busiest, but yet, more than 70% of death and serious injuries occur on those streets. Uh, this is why we have uh, Mr. Bruce McVean on the line today to represent one of these 33 local authorities. Mr. McVean is Assistant Director for Transportation at the City of London. Uh, the city is known all over the world as the uh, Square Mile, the historic heart of London. Uh, so Mr. McVean, hello. Uh, what's the role of your administration as part of the Vision Zero agenda and how does it uh, complement the role of TfL? Yeah, uh, thank you Alex and um, hello everybody. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, um, we're responsible as the local authority for uh, the square mile like the other uh, 32 boroughs uh, in London for the vast majority of streets. Uh, in London and uh, as you know they're not always the busiest in terms of uh, carrying uh, numbers of motor vehicles but uh, certainly in the, in the city of London where we have incredibly high levels uh, of walking uh, especially during the, the working day as, as um, people not familiar with the city we, we have about half a million people commute into the city each day well in more normal times we have half a million people commuting into the city each day and most of those uh, walk so our streets are very busy of people walking and some of the busiest streets for people walking are, uh, are, are ours um, but also TfL streets in the city also have incredibly high numbers of uh, people walking on them. So um, I guess it all depends how you, you measure busyness uh, um, for that and we're very clear that we want to make sure that the city is a great place to walk and a, a safe place to, to walk as part of that. So um, we obviously work very closely with Transport for London um, both to deliver change on their streets um, but also to make sure that the uh, policies that we have in place and we have our own transport uh, strategy uh, match and align uh, with the Mayor of London's transport strategy um, and uh, that we're adopting uh, best practice and learning uh, from across London and from what TfL can teach us as well. So as Stuart has said, you know, um, TfL uh, have adopted the safe systems approach as have we. Um, the measures, uh, I guess, kind of what people might expect. So safer streets, um, we're, we obviously look to um, address those areas with particularly high numbers uh, of collisions uh, and people um, uh, killed, or, killed or injured. Um, but we deliver across the square mile uh, improvements uh, for that. So it's big projects, you know, sorting out some of our most dangerous junctions, uh, as well as much smaller projects, which I think are really important to making sure that people feel safe on the streets. So whether that's just, you know, raising the carriageway at the entrance to side streets so that vehicles are slowed down as they turn into those 
uh, and people walking have priority across uh, across those areas. So we have a, a quite a comprehensive uh, program for that, but you know, focused on the most uh, risky uh, locations. Um, speed is something that we're also responsible for setting our speed limits. We've had a 20 mile an hour or to about 30 kilometer an hour speed limit in the city for several years now. I'm really pleased that this year all of Transport for London streets became 20 mile an hour as well. Uh, we're also now in the process of looking to introduce a 15 mile an hour, so about 20 kilometers an hour speed limit. Um, something we need permission from central government to do, which we'll be asking for um, uh, later this month or early in October. Um, and we think that's absolutely uh, critical, both in terms of obviously reducing um, the severity of collisions or the likelihood of them occurring, but also I think sending a very clear message that this is a place where um, people are driving and riding need to, um, you know, behave differently. Um, safer vehicles, I guess one of the things to touch on here is we're very keen to reduce the number of vehicles on our streets. Um, and we're, you know, whether that's through changes to the congestion charge and bringing in a new version of road user charging or taking our own steps to uh, reduce the number of freight vehicles on our streets, number of vehicles making deliveries, change those to cargo cycles or even deliveries on foot. Um, uh, and also in particular, kind of make sure that those um, larger delivery vehicles, which pose a particular risk, aren't on our streets at the busiest times of day for people walking and cycling. So morning and evening rush hours, for example. And then finally on safer behaviours, um, we at the City of London, uh, we're, we're, we're unique in many ways. And one of the things that also makes us unique is we have our own police force. So uh, Andy, who you'll hear from later, uh, is responsible for the rest of London, but we have our own police force for the city who are absolutely crucial partners in this. And you know, um, much of what you'll hear from Andy in terms of what the Met Police have done has been mirrored in the city as well. But you know, one of the things we've done recently with them is working with them on safer behaviours, particularly around speed uh, and dangerous driving. And I guess one of those interesting things that you can do is you know, helping them uh, and giving them funding so that their officers can spend more time on our streets uh, addressing those uh, as well. So I think those partnerships with the police uh, and with others, um, not just around enforcement, but you know, the crucial role they play in, uh, in engaging uh, with the public on these issues as well is absolutely uh, key. Thank you. So you have um, you have a partnership with the City of London Police providing funding for them to dedicate resources to road safety. Is that what you said? Yeah, well, they have dedicated resources for it as well. But essentially what we've been doing is is is, is helping them spend more time. So paying for overtime, I guess, is the, uh, um, the short um, answer on that. So it means that their officers can be out even more than they had originally planned to be. Uh, for that and and um, the, the campaigns that we run together are backed up by the presence of, of officers on the street uh, as well. You, you mentioned uh, 15 miles per hour limit which is about 20 kilometers an hour uh, is the new limit you envisage and you're, you're seeking authorization for that. Uh, where did you get that idea from? Is it uh, something that uh, other countries do that inspired you? Yes so I think um, well, 20 kilometer zones, uh, 20 kilometer an hour zones are quite common uh, across cities across Europe. Um, so that's definitely part of it. Um, I think we're looking to do something that's probably something more. So we're looking to do every street uh, in the city would have a 15 mile an hour uh, speed limit. But that's, that's part of the inspiration. And um, part of it is just recognizing that, you know, particularly in somewhere where such high levels of people walk and more and more people are choosing to cycle as well. So cycling has grown well, quadrupled over the last um, 20 years or so uh, in the city. Um, that's, you know, that reducing speed is absolutely key to reducing collisions, reducing the severity of them, but also making sure that people feel safe and comfortable on our streets. It's not all, you know, just about obviously the very important uh, goal of delivering Vision Zero, but it's making sure that people feel safe uh, as well. So it's absolutely key for that. I'll, I'll let you all into a secret. At one point, it was going to be 10 miles an hour. Uh, and, then, and then we went out with a speed gun and uh, realized just how slow that is. But also, uh, I think crucially, that almost everyone riding a bike would be breaking the speed limit. Um, and uh, and um, obviously, that has its own challenges. Um, so we, we settled on 15 uh, in the end uh, for it. 
Well done for the, for the ambition. <laughs> it's nice to hear that. So uh, we've heard from, from Bruce that the city of London already adopted a speed limit of 20 miles per hour on all streets. But other local authorities have adopted the same blanket approach in London. And that raises the question of the enforcement, naturally. Uh, so for this, I turn to the London Metropolitan Police. Uh, Mr. Cox, in, in most parts of the world, police resources are stretched and little is left to fight road danger. Uh, th this doesn't seem to happen in London. Is it true? And, and if so, please, uh, please tell us why. Yeah, thanks, Alex. And thanks so much for having me on. And I'm really pleased to speak and obviously share any experiences that we've developed over the last couple of years. I've worked in the Roads and Transport Command since 2017. I took the lead for Vision Zero at the start of uh, 2019. And I think it's so much broader than that. Policing is only obviously a small part of any solution to road safety. And I think it had to recognise that. But it plays an important part in both changing the public perception and the whole narrative around it. So we had a really engaging approach for the last two years or so where we have been openly using social media, we have been in the media, we have been in, uh, in, in working very closely with obviously TFL who are our absolute key strategic partner. But actually as Victoria representing Road Peace will be able to vouch, we've engaged all the key partners, not only in London, but also, also nationally. And I think that was part of recognizing that we can't enforce our way out of a, a killed and serious injury collision culture that drivers have. So we had to really work with our partners to get our message out there that actually we are there, we will enforce, and actually, um, you know, it's really socially unacceptable to continue to speed and trying to drive that message home to move away from perhaps a culture that policing um, should go and catch crime or criminals, sorry, instead of dealing with traffic offences, to try and define it to the, the vision that it is traffic crime and we're there because actually, you know, so often people that commit traffic offences are also committing other criminality as well. And actually when you consider the impact and in London last year we had 125 people die uh, in, in London um, there was lots and lots of coverage around our homicide rate um, around knife crime and other forms of um, death but very little coverage around road death and we were trying to change the narrative to, to, to make the public fully understand the impact and the risk that that people have and, and therefore when, it, when we come to enforcement rather than target everyone everywhere and everything uh, we move very much to a risk based approach which was targeting the most dangerous drivers the most dangerous roads and the most dangerous issues and undoubtedly um, from our data and all our research that we've utilized the most dangerous issue by far in a way is speeding um, so once we define that speeding is the most dangerous issue and there's other forms of you know, drink drive and so on but speeding is absolutely the most dangerous once we defined that i think that gave us the you know the legit legitimacy to sort of explain to our public um, about the dangers of speeding, um, the risk it poses to them and, and other road users, and really robustly enforce some um, speeding. And we've dramatically, dramatically increased our speeding um, offences. And interestingly, um, obviously the City of London are very much um, pro this as well. We, we've taken the approach of our, our speed enforcement into 20 and 30 mile an hour zones as well. So, uh, and that was in recognition of um, more vulnerable road users being in those those zones, so your cyclists and your pedestrians uh, are more likely to be in 20 and 30 mile an hour zones. We know that our 20 and 30 mile an hour roads have the higher proportion of our killed and serious injury collisions. So essentially what we've done is police them, identify the right roads, identify the right times to be in those roads and make sure we've got a visible presence uh, and enforce on our, on our speeding offences. Um, but really trying to change the narrative to say to the public, look, we are speeding, these are the type of speeding offences we're, we're seeing. This is our enforcement approach influencing all of our partners around that and explaining to the public why we're there, the impact of speed and what um, they can do to be part of the, the road safety solution as well. Thank you. Looking at, at social media, I realised there is a clear and consistent focus uh, in your team and the um, hashtag fatal four. Yeah. Uh, I suspect these are the four most dangerous behaviours on the road. Uh, is that correct? It is. So that represents speeding, drink and drug drive, um, using your phone whilst at the wheel and not wearing your, your seatbelt. So we talk about the fatal four both in London and nationally. I very much stress the, the speeding element of all of that would come first for us. And we also talk about uninsured driving as, as a, a trigger to you know, additional risk as well for, for drivers.
Thank you. Now I turn towards uh, Stuart Reed again, but before so, I'd like to invite once again people listening to the webinar to ask uh, questions to the panel using the Q and A box, and we will come to that near the end. Uh, so, Mr. Reed, the London Action Plan for Vision Zero uh, puts a focus on vehicle safety. Some would find it odd for a local authority to influence vehicle design. Uh, which is typically regulated at another level, at national or international level. So how will this work? So, so I hope you can hear me this time. I'm sitting, let's, on, let's see. My, uh, sitting on top of my broadband roof. <laughs> um, we, we, we absolutely recognise that vehicle safety has to be part of the mix of uh, interventions that will achieve Vision Zero. And although it's not directly within our control. We have um, leverage and we have the opportunity to pursue um, pursue improvements in vehicle technology or, to, or to, to, to use our leverage to bring those technologies into the vehicle fleet in London. So two examples which are in our Vision Zero Action Plan are firstly the work that we have done uh, working with the European Commission and others to bring in the direct vision standard for heavy goods vehicles, which requires a certain um, a measurable standard um, uh, that, that, that indicate how well the driver of that vehicle can see what is going on around them. And we are bringing in a permitting system so that from next year, um, only vehicles which meet a minimum level of standard will be allowed into London because our view is that if we're going to achieve Vision Zero, we have to tackle the causes of risk. And the causes of risk are generally motorised vehicles. They're not the vulnerable road users who are uh, in collision with those vehicles. Vulnerable road users are not a cause of risk. Motorised vehicles are a cause of risk. So our view is that you shouldn't bring dangerous vehicles into our city. And we have worked very hard and uh, very closely with the European Commission and others to enable that standard to be brought in. Um, in the same way, we have set out a bus safety standard. We have a whole program for bus safety um, because we commission the activity of the bus operators in London. Uh, there are several thousand uh, buses, just over 9,000 buses operating in London all of which operate under contract to transport for London. And we have set out uh, not just a current standard, but a, an incrementally increasing standard for the safety features on those buses. So, for example, we have said that we will not allow any new bus to come into the fleet from last year that does not have um, mandatory intelligent speed adaptation. Uh, we've brought in a whole range of other features alongside that. So we have, we have leverage as a... Uh, as, as a, uh, a regulator of the bus services. We have leverage as an authority that has um, other policy levers within London and we aim to use our influence um, uh, wherever we can, both with the national government and with international organisations such as the EU. And I, I should say we were, uh, we were very pleased and very much in support of the EU's decision to regulate uh, and mandate uh, ISA and uh, autonomous emergency braking from 2022. So where, uh, where transnational authorities are bringing these regulations in, we're in support, and where we think we have specific local needs, then we will use a range of uh, uh, influences to try and uh, bring those technologies in too. Thank you. We hear you perfectly well. Let's continue, let's stay with you. Uh, there seem to be uh, synergies uh, between London's Vision Zero agenda and London's public health agenda and strategies. So I'd like to ask you, Stuart, uh, what kind of um, tensions did you overcome when uh, linking the two agendas together? Well, I think the, I think the, um, the sort of the first uh, hurdle is really to understand that active travel is healthy travel and that we need to get away from the idea that vulnerable road users are the problem because actually from a public health perspective vulnerable road users i.e people walking people cycling using active travel modes 
they're part of the solution. They don't pollute, they don't emit particulates, they don't, uh, they, 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 they have um, uh, negligible carbon footprints, uh, and they're very ro low risk to everybody else. And I think the thing we tried to do with the mayor's transport strategy is recognize that our agenda for public health and our agenda for active travel and our agenda for casualty reduction were all the same thing. Um, and, and so that was the sort of starting point in being able to bring all those things together and say, actually, they are compatible and we need to move beyond a sort of superficial idea that people who are traveling actively are more at risk and therefore we should be uh, concerned about that. Um, but I think it's also true to say that the, the, our Vision Zero program, our Vision Zero ambition is far from complete. And I think we have more to do to link the, uh, the health services and the public health services into, into our wider agenda. Um, so so th there, is, there, is, um, there is progress we still need to make uh, in building a, 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 a wider and deeper coalition of agencies to deliver Vision Zero. Do you think uh, that by building a bigger coalition with public health, uh, professionals, you you will unlock new possibilities, new new actions. Do, do you have any example of that? Well, I think I think there are, there are there are certainly um, some practical things. So, as, as as many of the people on this call will know, if they are if they work for a city authority, one of the challenges is data uh, is under and targeting your your interventions. And in the UK, uh, we have the data that's collected by the police service when there's a collision which is really uh you know fundamentally important to us but we also know that there are a lot of things that happen out on the highway where people uh don't present themselves to the police but they do present themselves to the health service and being able to link the data from the police and the data from the health service together to really get a a rounded picture of what's really going on would be a huge step forward. So that's just, just one example. Um, but we also know that we have a, a crisis of inactivity and obesity and poor health in the UK, and that um, active travel is one of the, uh, the remedies for that. And we are just starting to see the health service beginning to prescribe physical activity and being able to prescribe walking and cycling as a as, as a medical response to some of those public health problems and then we can uh, we can provide an interface there and we can provide the, the training and the safe environments so that people can respond to that, um, that that motivation from their doctors to behave in a way which is both better for their health better for London and uh, is aligned with our, our broader agenda so those are just two two, two examples Fantastic, thank you. I look forward to that, uh, to my, my doctor prescribing me a, a bike share membership. It's going to be fun. <laughs> uh, it takes us straight into the next question. Do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic will make it easier for you to deliver the road safety vision? I think the honest answer is we don't yet know. So in the short term, in London, it has certainly provided um, a momentum to act much more quickly than we might have done um, a year ago to to bring in facilities to enable people to walk and cycle um, to enable a space to be allocated away from motorized travel and towards active travel and because of the the, the, the sort of crisis that uh, COVID has brought on the city, then we've been able to act very quickly to bring in temporary facilities to enable active travel. And that's, that's been um, a huge opportunity, I think, to reimagine how London could be with more, you know, y y with more progressive policies and with, with, with a much wider application of some of the things we want to do. So that's very positive. There is also a, a, a negative risk, though, which is that in the UK, the, um, the, 
the, the one of the consequences of COVID has been that people wish to maintain a distance um, and therefore they have uh, chosen and, and we've advised them to, particularly in the early parts of the pandemic, uh, to, to travel less on the London Underground, the transit, tran transit uh, service for London, and let, travel less on the buses. And if a proportion of those people choose to instead move to modes which are uh, more risky for London, such as, uh, such as to drive instead, then over time that, that, that could increase risk. And so we're, we're looking to, to introduce these, uh, a whole program of schemes that we call street space that's designed to enable people to, to travel actively. And we, uh, we're, we're looking at how we can both enable that active travel and bring the right number of people back onto the transit modes so that travel is not displaced onto motorised modes, which will elevate the risk for everybody. So it's the, the, the jury is still out at the moment, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, but, but we certainly see this as a, an opportunity to accelerate the agenda about uh, uh, the reallocation of road space. Thank you. Uh, this is the kind of question where I'd like to ask the other members of the panel to say if they, if they have something to add to that. Uh, it could be Vicky, Bruce, Andy, just raise your hand so I can see. Yeah, Bruce? Uh, thanks, Alex. And I, I kind of I agree with what Stuart said, but I, I suppose to, um, I think some of the opportunities here are what, what the COVID-19 response has done, and it, it's interesting suddenly having reducing danger of infection added to uh, transport aims as well as reducing road danger. Um, is it has shown that when there is an urgent need, we can move and we can mobilise incredibly quickly to make, albeit temporary, changes to our streets. Um, and you know, uh, to be clear, everything we have done so far, and it's quite extensive in the city, as I said, about ten kilometres uh, of, of streets where we've delivered interventions so far, plus more that TfL have done, um, is temporary, and it could come out tomorrow if a vaccine was discovered. But you know, I think it has shown us that we can respond quickly there. And I do wonder whether there is an opportunity, I'm not quite sure exactly what it is yet, um, but for us to respond quicker in locations where we know we have uh, high incidences of, uh, of collisions or, or, or high levels uh, of risk. Again, even if it's temporary initially, um, and then may become permanent uh, in, due, in due course. So I think you know it's it's definitely driving I think a, a, a rethinking of how we might approach um, projects and how we might speed up uh, delivery of projects and how we might respond uh, to other urgent urgent issues and obviously um, you know vision zero and and uh, and uh, road danger reduction is is arguably one of those um, in some locations and then I think the other thing as well you know as Stuart has kind of uh, highlighted you know we're putting in measures that are very much designed to make it easier easy safe and comfortable for people to walk and cycle and to make sure people feel safe and comfortable uh, on our streets despite the need for social distancing uh, as well um, whether some of the, whether those will be retained um, in the in the short to medium term is, is is still to be seen but I think you know they have, well, they will help everyone kind of reimagine what streets could be like, and I think you know lead to an acceleration of delivery uh, in the medium term, even if if it's not an immediate kind of retention of, of the temporary measures that have gone in so far. So, you know, hopefully it will be a it will be one of the positive outcomes that comes out of the, the very challenging situation we all find ourselves in now. I see Andy has got his hand up. Yeah, hi, thanks, Alex. You asked the question sort of, has COVID-19 had a, an impact um, or presented an opportunity? And I think it's, it's almost like road safety, um, certainly in the UK, certainly in London, had a moment really during the, during the pandemic. I think the whole sort of social perception of road danger changed um, a little bit. I think people saw speeding was obviously a, a dramatic issue during um, the lockdown period. Um, I think the risk of speeding was brought to the public attention. And I think, um, the whole infrastructure, the design, Stuart, um, has obviously articulated around um, opportunities around that. But I think in terms of the way people drive, the social responsibility for driving, uh, the need to drive sensibly, um, use of technology such, such as dash cam, um, limiters, speed limiters and so on, has 
got an increased opportunity. And I think the whole pandemic really did right and as I say, raise the public social responsibility factor around how we drive. So it, it, there has been some benefit in that regard. Yeah, I'd just like to say as well, I think, I think that's it, is that it, it kind of like raised the, the profile, I think, of um, road safety and road danger up the agenda. I, I kind of found it myself, like obviously we had, there were less crashes during the lockdown period, but there were some, still some very serious crashes. And I kind of found it quite depressing, actually, that we've managed to have loads less vehicles on the road, but we're still getting, you know, a significant number of people killed and seriously injured because of, of speeding. So I think um, yeah, I think it, 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 it raised the profile of, of road danger, which is fantastic. But I think the other thing as well is in terms of all of these new changes that are happening, which are great in terms of getting more people walking and cycling, um, I think it's difficult as well for the different boroughs in terms of the, I know just from someone, a friend of mine who works at Islington Council, the number of people that are writing in, you know, objecting to changes. Um, I think, I hope that these temporary measures um are kind of consulted properly with the public and people also have time to kind of understand them instead of you know instead of politics you know councillors just looking at these messages coming in and then deciding actually the scheme's no good um, i hope that things have been moving really quickly but i hope that um you know it ends up being really considered in terms of, of the impact that they've had thank you uh, Mrs. Lebrecht, we're going to stay with you for, for a minute. Your charity Road Peace works to reform the justice system in the UK. So I'd like to, to ask you what kind of changes you're asking for. Well, so there's, there's a, 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 lot of, a lot of things we're asking for. There was actually big um, news this week in the UK because the Ministry of Justice had promised a couple of years ago, well, in 2000, 2017, um, to introduce new... Uh, charges and also change the sentencing. So um, at the moment, there isn't a charge for causing serious injury by careless driving. So it means that um, someone, you know, like me, where you'd have had a really, really horrible crash, you luckily didn't die. Uh, but because often there's not a student, a student of the Crown Prosecution Service, but there's not the conviction, they don't want to then convict for the higher charge of dangerous driving but that doesn't exist causing serious injury by careless driving. So that's, that's a big bit of news that's come out this week. They're going to be introducing that. Um, I think the other thing as well, in terms of the justice system, it all, starts with, it all starts with the collision investigation. So if there's not a good collision investigation that is done, if there's not enough funding or if there's not, you know, the will or it's not seen, it comes back to it being, you know, road crime being treated as real crime. I think if you compare the number of resources that go into a homicide investigation compared to, a road death investigation is quite startlingly different. Um, and I think, you know, Andy Cox's team does a fantastic job, but, you know, with the fatalities and the, you know, the, the really life-changing injuries. But there's, I think it's nearly 4,000 people that were seriously injured in London last year. That's a lot of people and not everyone's getting the same level of collision investigation, I would say. I think that is an area that needs a bit of work. So. Yeah, justice doesn't happen until you get a good collision investigation. So I think that's something that we're keen to, to campaign on. Thank you. I, I realise we seem to have a lot of questions uh, on, in the Q&A box. Uh, so I'm going to turn to my colleague, uh, Rafaela, uh, to, to hear from, uh, from people attending the webinar. Yes, Alex, we had many questions. Thank you all for sending them. Um, there is one question that I think Stuart may clarify about the coordination between the different uh, authorities, uh, especially the councils or the boroughs. Uh, many people are asking if you have any recommendation to improve the coordination between them, or if you have any experience, for instance, of a borough that was reluctant into adopting a Vision, vision Zero approach, um, and if you did, how, how was this, this interaction? And if you successfully uh, convinced this, this borough? Um, so there are 33 boroughs in London. And as Alex said, they are the highway uh, authorities for 95% of the roads in London. And each of those boroughs is under uh, separate political control. So, as you can imagine, there's a, a wide range of responses to any initiative, um, including 
vision zero. And, and that, that's legitimate because in some ways, each of those boroughs, the reason there are 33 is because um, they, they represent different geographies and different populations and different, um, different urban structures. Um, because London is not really one city, it's, 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 it's several cities all crammed into a small space. Um, so so the, the, the boroughs are required to respond to the mayor's transport strategy, and that's a first layer. Um, and within that, then Transport for London provides some funding to the boroughs to help deliver implementation plans for the, for the mayor's transport strategy. So we've done our best to uh, provide an explanation of Vision Zero, to provide the, uh, the data that the boroughs need to help investigate uh, their own situation and work out the best strategy for them. Um, and I think we have seen over time, and I don't think Transport for London can take all of the credit for this. Many of the boroughs have led the way, and in some cases, uh, Transport for London has been following. So I think we need to be in Transport for London, we need to be uh, have some humility about this. Um, that you you have boroughs, you know, such as the City of London, who are now talking about 15 miles an hour, whereas Transport for London has only just caught up with the idea of 20 miles an hour. Um, but I think I think what we've seen is that this is an investment um, of time and commitment that will will require years. And I've certainly seen some of the boroughs move their positions. Uh, uh, become more um, amenable to things which five years ago might have seemed radical in that borough, like a blanket 20 mile an hour limit. And I think the, the, the thing which moves that opinion is, is twofold, I think. One is uh, a demonstration of what's possible. So like any idea, there are innovators and there are early adopters and then there are late adopters and there are laggards. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the, the best way of persuading a borough of what is possible is to look at what other boroughs have done, and what has been delivered and what, what, what is imaginable. Um, and then the other thing is, I, I want to sort of reflect slightly uh, on a point that Andy made about the, the public mood and the behaviour around this, because certainly in London, around 90 to 95 percent of the collisions which take place are a result of somebody's behavior. They are uh, consciously or unconsciously, somebody has done something which has resulted in a collision. Very, very rare for, you know, um, a bit of vehicle engineering to fail or a bit of infrastructure to fail. These are choices that people make. And all of our interventions, whether it be intelligent speed assistance or changing a road layout or police enforcement, are all ultimately directed to try and influence that choice and influence that behavior. And so I think we need to regard Vision Zero not just as a, a set of policy instruments or street design interventions, but almost as a sort of much broader movement. And that's why I think it's so important that we influence the public and it's so important that we have a, a broad coalition for this and that we hear a range of voices in this discussion, including the voices of people who have had their lives changed by road collisions. And I think by creating that public demand over, a, you know, it won't be a, an overnight thing, this, is, this will take time, but by creating a demand for a more just and a safer and a more livable city, we make it possible to continually uh, stretch what it is possible for a borough to imagine and for an elected member in a borough to accept that they're their voters want um, and to give everybody the courage to keep moving forward. So sorry, a bit of a bit of a kind of um, broad answer to a very specific question, but I think I think we, we have to regard this at those two levels, the level of specific interventions, which boroughs can uh, learn from one another and which we can help enable, and also at the much broader level of a, a societal change, which reimagines what our streets are for and what's possible on them. Thank you, Stuart. Um, regarding this culture change, I think we can ask Vicky. Um, we often talk about data in numbers in road safety. We have a question here for you. How your work at Roadpiece made a change on that? How to look at 
people affected by by a, a road crash uh, in this sea of numbers? Yeah, I think um, well, I think there's lots of examples where um, bringing you know the human the human impacts because well, yeah, we talk about you know four thousand people seriously injured, one hundred and twenty five people killed. Like that almost doesn't re that doesn't really permeate, does it, as to what that actually what that actually means. Um, so I said before at Road Peace we we support people that have been in, in, in crashes. So that's a lot of our work is around providing emotional and practical support. But often people, you know, often people want to change things and make the, make the world better and, and, you know, prevent this happening to other people when the worst thing has happened to them. So we, you know, we have a group of people, you know, in London as, as well, a group of people that are wanting to talk about what happened to them and want to uh, make changes in the system. Um, I think uh, Transport for London and, 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 and the police and Andy and, and um, the people that we work with have really recognised that. Um, you know, there's lots of examples where we've done, you know, kind of media work okay. around, um, in, you know, including the victim's voice there. Um, and, you know, what we're talking about the, you know, the direct vision standard, um, you know, the, the, the amazing scheme that they put together in terms of getting rid of the most dangerous vehicles. Like I've been very, very involved in, in that because of what happened to me. And I think it just, you know, shows the human element. And I think it, it is what Stuart was saying about changing uh, the kind of wider message. You have to have people's, people's voices in that. That's very important. Thank you. Uh, Andy, we have some questions for you too. Um, many questions regarding the speeding enforcement. Uh, do you have any lessons, any recommendations on how to do this speeding enforcement to be successfully and provide some positive results? Yeah, I think so. So I think um, in terms of legislation as well, we heard briefly about um, the, the current consultations happening in the UK around the seriousness of a collision and perhaps um, how we might, you know, for example, uplift the sentence levels to life if it's a fatal collision um, and it's linked to dangerous driving, which I think is really important. But I think what's really important as well, legislatively, we consider the risk of that speed imposes before a crash. So at the moment, for instance, I draw a comparison to, um, there's lots of talk in London around knife crime um, this year. So if somebody goes onto the street carrying a knife, is stopped by police before they use that knife they will rightly potentially face really significant sentencing options but for instance if they drive a vehicle and we've had a driver convicted this week um, for driving at 163 miles an hour during the covid period um 163 miles an hour but they got a six month ban um you know they weren't put into prison they weren't given a very substantial fine and i think um, unfortunately, legislation doesn't often consider the risk that the speeding driver poses until that crash occurs. Um, and I, th I think so. It's really important from a legislation perspective. We introduce that to Terence and understand the risk and devastation that can be caused by somebody that drives so recklessly before a crash. From a police enforcement perspective, I think the lessons that we've um, very much learned is to really focus in on the most dangerous drivers, the most dangerous roads. Um, and really focusing upon upon speed. Um, so we, are, we, we do know our roads through the data. So my advice is to really understand your data, work out where your collisions occur, work out where your most vulnerable road users are likely to be, um, know where your speeding occurs. So we did have data uh, systems in place to, to report around our, our speeding, um, during, particularly during the pandemic. Um, and we deployed accordingly. So we set our resources up, whether that's 24 seven, into the most challenging roads at the most, uh, the most appropriate time. And therefore we were there to both act as a deterrent, but also enforce drivers and then constantly communicate that. So I think the really strong lesson is to communicate um, outcomes and rationale. So you win the public confidence and we've definitely seen an uptake in terms of how the public perceive what we're doing. And sometimes I think the public can be critical around speed enforcement. They don't really recognize the risk it poses. So I think by educating them, explaining that we're there to save life, drawing that link to dangerous drivers so often being involved in other forms of criminality and making sure we're policing the most dangerous issues at the right time, right place, wins, wins that confidence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have some questions on data collection. Uh, 
Is this also a collaborative work between different authorities? Maybe Stuart can answer that, but also Bruce. Um, how does it work in, in London? And there is also a question related to that about near-miss analysis. Is London already working with this type of analysis of identifying danger uh, before serious crashes happen? Uh, so, as I said earlier, data um, and the analysis of data is a critical element of our, um, our, our strategy. Um, the data, the, the, and obviously there are many different types of data, the data around collisions that have occurred is collected by the police, um, by Andy, Andy and his colleagues, um, according to a set of standards which are set out nationally by the UK government. Um, uh, so that, that data, which we, the sort of jargon is stats 19, that's what we talk about. Uh, so if I use that term, that, that's what I'm talking about. Um, the, the police collect that, but then we work closely with the police uh, on the analysis of that data. So they make that available to us in real time. So we can constantly interrogate that data and use that to identify uh, the trends that are emerging, uh, to identify hot locations so that we can work with Andy and his teams to make sure that they, the, their, their policing response is as agile as, as, as it can be uh, and we're feeding them that intelligence to help them uh, do that. But they are also, obviously the police also have their own intelligence gathering activity which feeds into this mix. And what, what we are also doing is um, we have now started to build, or we've built a first iteration of a, a risk model, because I think one of the criticisms of purely relying on collisions uh, as, as a source of information is it's a lagging indicator. You're always looking back um, and there is a degree of randomness perhaps. So you are, you are fixing a problem which may never, never reoccur anyway if you only look back. So we're also developing a model to look at risk on the roads in London, and that contains many elements of data. Collisions, of course, is part of it, but so is population, frontages, vulnerable road users, and we're trying to build a much more predictive model. And as part of that, yes, we are starting to look at near-miss data and uh, developing a, um, a partnership with some vehicle manufacturers to um, obtain telematics data so we can look not just at uh, collisions, but also speeding, harsh braking, harsh cornering, even um, uh, even perhaps locations where a driver has felt they have to put their their hazard warning lights on. So that's all part of the uh, the development uh, element of what we do on Vision Zero, is to try to recognise not just where things have happened, but where things are likely to happen to try and preempt them happening. Because to, to, to sort of return to, to one of the key themes of this conversation, this is about real people, that we shouldn't be waiting for real people to be hurt and have their lives changed before we act. We should be trying to prevent that so that there are people um, who will never have to suffer that trauma uh, or that, that loss um, uh, because um, we, we've, we've got in front of the problem. Um, I, I'm afraid that our time is up, um, so I have, to, I have to end the webinar here, sadly, but our, our speakers will have a, a busy day ahead of them, I'm sure. Uh, so I'd like to thank very much our panel for taking the time to, to share their experience with others and with other cities in particular. Um, I invite you all once again to find our latest report on the ITF uh, website. The, the title is Best Practice for Urban Road Safety. Um, for your city to become a member of the ITF Safer City Streets Network, please simply contact us at the ITF. You will find the details of Rafaela and me on the ITF website. We hope to see you soon next week. Uh, for another webinar on safe speeds with speakers from Buenos Aires, from Bogota and from Fortaleza. We will talk about street design, speed limits and law enforcement. And the week after that, we will have another webinar uh, 
we would be talking about risk prediction, Stuart. That's precisely what, what you're developing. We will hear from uh, Rotterdam and uh, from New York City. Uh, but that's it for today. Thanks again for joining us and have a very nice rest of the day. Thank you.